Okay, everybody's on screen. Awesome. Well, welcome everybody to uh, day two of the celebration of nature. We have some great presenters for you today. Um, and the first person or people who are going to start us off today are Katie and Sarah with their presentation on wetlands. Perfect. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I'll just get set up by sharing my screen. Right. Does that look okay from your end? Yep, looks great. Perfect, sounds good. Well, um, thank you everyone for taking the uh, time to join us on uh, not really a sunny Sunday, but uh, an overcast Sunday anyway. Um, hopefully you all get a chance to go out and explore a little bit later on today. Um, so today I'm going to be doing a, a quick jam-packed uh, wetlands of presentation and then uh, Sarah is going to walk us through a Kahoot trivia game. So we're going to be testing your knowledge uh, about wetlands at the end. But it's just for fun, so no pressure at all. Um, if you, you know, if folks are joining that are, are already a part of the Young Naturalist Club, I can uh, only expect that they have a little bit of this knowledge already. So for some people it might be a bit of a refresher, um, but it never hurts nonetheless. And for some people, it might be all new. So I hope that uh, you find something in here for, for everyone today. So to get started, uh, first of all, who is Ducks Unlimited Canada? Uh, we are a national non-for-profit organization, and our mission is to conserve, restore, manage wetlands and associated habitats that benefit waterfowl, but not only waterfowl, but wildlife and people. We all, we all rely on wetlands in some way. So we do this through a number of different ways. So one, of course, is uh, what people probably know Ducks Limited most for is our on-the-ground habitat conservation projects. So whether this is um, protecting a wetland that is already existing, maybe it's creating new ones or restoring uh, wetlands. We also have our research and science department as well. So all of our work based on science and research, both that we do and of course uh, many partners and uh, universities here across Canada. And we also do education programs, which is why I'm here today. So we run a number of different education programs across Canada, but specifically in Nova Scotia we have uh, things like wetland field trips, how uh, we can deliver them, uh, adapting virtually, and also um, our treasured wetlands program, which we'll talk a bit and all of this work is really important to um, support public policy. And in Nova Scotia, we're very fortunate that we do have a, a wetland conservation policy. That being said, of course, as many policies, they can, uh, it can always use some improvement. So we want to educate people about that policy um, and what they can do to, to take action. So to get started, I'll talk a little bit about why wetlands in the first place. So we live, of course, on this beautiful planet that we have. Some people often call it the blue planet. And they call it the blue planet because, as you can see, it's mostly blue. And, of course, that blue represents ocean um, and water, I guess. So on planet Earth, our surface of, planet, of Earth is about 75% water and only about 25 to 30% land. So we have a lot of water on planet Earth. So the reason it. So I think everyone knows this, but of course most of that water that you see on our Earth's surface is of course salt water or, o or ocean water. So that water is not um, drinkable water, it's not the fresh water that we and so many other flora and fauna on planet Earth require to survive. So when you break it down, I have some graphs shown here, if you can imagine that all of the water on planet Earth is in that first column uh, to the left hand side. Um, that represents all the water on planet Earth. Like I said, about 97% of that is actually salt water. 
so that leaves only about 2.5 to 3 percent of it as fresh water. If you break down that fresh water even further, the majority of that is actually found in glaciers and ice caps and groundwater, areas that we can't necessarily access or is very difficult to access. And then, so if you break down that surface or other fresh water, which is only 1 percent of that original 3 percent, down even further, that's found um, in ground ice, permafrost, like in our tundras, um, and then a larger portion in our lakes, and then swamps, marshes, rivers, in our atmosphere, etc. So, if you look at the pie chart on the right hand side, if you take all of the water on planet Earth, there's actually only about less than 1% that is available to us on Earth. So it's only a very um, small amount, and of course, like I said, not only us as humans, but all of wildlife and flora and fauna rely on this fresh water. So that's why it is so important that we conserve and protect our fresh water sources. And uh, heads up, um, it's important to remember how much water on the planet Earth is fresh water. So again, that 2.5 to 3 percent. That may or may not be a hint for, for those that uh, Turning into the Kahoot in a bit. <laughs> so then I'm going to move on to our country. So in Canada, we are extremely fortunate. In fact, some people could say that we are the blue country. So we are home to about 25% um, of the world's wetlands. So not only do we have, um, you know, we have to hold ourselves accountable on a global scale, but of course on a national scale and certainly a provincial scale. So although it might seem, you know, we have lots of wetlands here, we have to uh, do our part to conserve these. So first of all, I should get into what is a wetland anyway? And often when I ask uh, young students this, even grade primaries, uh, their first answer is, it's a land that's wet. And they're not wrong, that's exactly what a wetland is. It's a land that is wet. Um, if you want to get into a little bit more of a scientific definition, um, the definition has that it includes poorly drained soils, so those are things like clay-based soils, um, hydrophytic vegetation, so that means plants that love water, and it has biological activities that are adapted to a wet environment. So if we look at, we have about five different types of wetlands from our class, Canadian classification system, and those wetlands are broken up into two groups. So one side, you'll see the mineral-based um, wetlands. So these are um, wetlands that have mineral-based foundations. And then we have our organic wetlands. So these are ones that have a lot of uh, decomposition from uh, organic peat moss, things like that. So first of all, we have our shallow open water, which is a mineral type of wetland. We have our marshes, and often people are familiar with marshes. These are the ones that um, typically a bit bigger, have a lot of open uh, surface water, and usually are characterized by a lot of cattails, lily pads, things like that. Of course, in Nova Scotia, we're very fortunate that we live along the coast, so we actually have two types of marshes in Nova Scotia. We have our freshwater marshes, but we also have our, our salt marshes. So have our swamps. So swamps are typically characterized by having a lot of um, dead standing trees or uh, living trees in and around their edges. Swamp. And a swamp can be both uh, mineral, either mineral based or organic. So moving over to our organic types of wetlands, we have our fens. We have our bumps. So both of these types of wetlands are very similar. They um, are characterized by having a lot of um, peat moss in them. And because of that, they are um, typically more acidic than our other types of wetlands. So you'll see some really cool carnivorous plants in there, like pitcher plants or sundews uh, that rely on um, insects to get some of their nutrients rather than solely from photosynthesis. So the main difference between a fen and a bog is that a fen has an inflow and an outflow of water, or input and an output, whereas bogs are um, a bit 
bit more stagnant. They don't have an inflow or an outflow. So they are areas of water that um, are accumulated by either uh, rain or groundwater or um, snow ground or common areas. So now that we know what wetlands are, why are they important? This could go on forever, but I'll just highlight a few. So of course, wetlands provide a habitat for many species of wildlife. They're very high in biodiversity. In fact, it's said that they are second um, in terms of biodiversity, in terms of habitat for all of planet Earth. Um, that being second only to rainforest. So they provide a shelter for all of the animals that live there. They provide a nursery, and they also provide a food source for the So when you think of wetlands and rainforests, obviously, you know, in a rainforest, you think of all of these animals, all of these birds flying around, and certainly wetlands are like that as well. But a lot of the biodiversity actually comes underwater. So in wetlands, we have a lot of aquatic macroinvertebrates, such as this one here. So does anyone want to take a guess at what this critter is? I'll turn the slide. It is a dragonfly. So if you look back, you can kind of see the uh, wings that have formed on its back. So essentially what happens in a dragonfly's life cycle is that the adult um, deposits eggs into the water typically um, attached to some kind of vegetation. And when the, those eggs are ready to hatch, they hatch into their nymph stage, and they shed those exo, they shed the exoskeleton. Then when they're ready to become an adult, they melt on some vegetation like cattails or lily pads, shed their exoskeleton, dry off their wings, and fly away. So a lot of people don't realize that uh, dragonflies are just one of many insects that rely on water to complete their life cycle. So this one is another interesting pond critter. This one here is a caddisfly larvae. And uh, the top picture there, you can see it's built, it's um, not a cocoon, but a home rather, that has these pieces of sticks or plants. It also even has like a little pebble in there. So caddisflies will build these homes out of whatever material is available to them. So they might look a little bit different depending on where you, where you are, whether you're in uh, a stagnant wetland or whether you're in a river, for instance. So many species rely on wetlands, including many that are at risk. So when we think of species at risk, we often think of, you know, our big furry mammals. And in fact, when you do a Google search, this is what comes up. So a lot of them are large mammals. We do have some sea creatures in there. Um, but, you know, our pandas and our lions, they typically are the, the poster species for species at risk, which certainly we want to do what we can to help to protect them. With that being said, we have many species in Nova Scotia and certainly in Canada that unfortunately fall into these categories as well. So this is just a quick snapshot of the current um, number of species in each category. So this is from the Committee of the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, or Pacific. So this is nationally, this isn't specific to Nova Scotia, although you can find out specific Nova Scotia information on uh, the government's website. So we have these different categories. So extinct, of course, means that the species no longer exists. Extricated means that no longer exists in the wild in Canada, but it could exist elsewhere. Um, and then the category before that is endangered, which means that it's facing imminent extirpation or extinction. Um, then comes threatened and special concern. So there's a community that is formed that assesses these species um, based on these criteria and a number of other factors as well. So unfortunately, you can see that these numbers are, are rather big. So for instance, in the endangered category alone, we have 306 species um, that are considered endangered in Canada. So we have many in our own backyard that we want to protect. So here are a few that we have in Nova Scotia. So in the top left, you'll see the mainland moose, um, which is, uh, is considered endangered in Nova Scotia. And of course, if you don't already know, um, this is a separate species from the Cape Breton population. So many people say that 
what are you talking about? There's so many in Cape Breton, and there are. But it's actually a, a different uh, subspecies of moose. So this is the mainland moose, um, such a mainland Nova Scotia, and um, it's been uh, decimated over the years uh, for a number of different reasons. Of course, deforestation being one, um, but also uh, other habitat loss and also a parasite framework. We also have the little brown bat down here in the corner. Um, and the little brown bat, like many other bat species, has faced a very, very sharp decline, um, primarily due to a fungus called white nose syndrome that creates nice white nose syndrome. This plant here is one of my favorites. This one here is called the thread leaf sundew. And it's actually found only in five bogs in all of Canada. And those happen to be on the southwestern uh, tip of the province here. So very rare. And you can see those sticky nodules on those plants. So that, of course, is one of the uh, carnivorous plants that I talked about that um, thrive in bogs. Then we also have, of course, many people know the monarch butterfly. We also have uh, a turtle here. This one here is the Blandings turtle. You can tell by its really dome-shaped um, shell. Uh, unfortunately, as of uh, last month, now all of the turtles that we have in Nova Scotia are on the species at risk list in one category or another. So um, very vulnerable. Um, and of course, all of these animals and wildlife and plants rely on wetlands in one way or another. We also, lastly, we have our bird here, and this is a peregrine falcon. So like um, the bald eagle, it was impacted by the use of DDT, pesticide, which created um, the shell to be um, very fragile. So there, although there's evidence to suggest that their populations are increasing, um, they haven't been reassessed yet, so they still remain on the species at risk list. So after saying all this, of course, our, our um, migrating birds rely on wetlands a resting place. So throughout um, North America, we actually have four different migratory paths. So in Nova Scotia, we're of course located on the Atlantic Blue. So this is why it's important to not only conserve wetlands here in Nova Scotia, but certainly all along um, the eastern seaboard, down into the United States, and even into um, places like Mexico and the Caribbean. Some of these birds make these very long distances. Um, some of them also make very short distances, too. So, of course, this one is extremely important. Uh, wetlands filter our water. I'm not saying to go take a glass of water and go drink it straight out of the wetland. wetland. Uh, that might not be the best thing to do. But, with that being said, overall, wetlands really do a really great job of filtering the water. They're, in fact, said to be the kidneys of an ecosystem. So, of course, what happens when you have heavy rainfall, that rain accumulates into our rivers, it flows down to a wetland, and in a wetland, of course, the water um, is very slow moving, so that allows a lot of the sediments, particles, runoff, including things like pesticides or, or other harmful chemicals like those, to drop down in the water column, go to the bottom of a wetland, and to be further broken down. So eventually, the cleaner water flows into our um, rivers and streams. So wetlands help to prevent flooding and drought. They're essentially a sponge on the landscape. So you can see the bottom picture here. Um, this is a bog. And you can see these um, moss. This is actually sphagnum moss. You can see these individual plants. They can hold a water. So they are very highly absorbent. And of course, they also have those little areas in between each plant that can hold water as well. So when we have times of really heavy rain, that absorbs the water um, into a wetland versus it going into your basement. On the opposite of that, which has certainly happened to Nova Scotia the past number of summers, is that when it gets really dry, our wetlands actually release some of that water into nearby areas that we did. So wetlands also help to burn flooding in another way too, uh, along our coast. So, of course, one of the effects of climate change is sea level rise and increased storm surges. So, that makes our coastline, and in Nova Scotia, we have a ridiculous amount of it, uh, very vulnerable and very susceptible. So, our salt marshes provide a really great, um, not only 
right um, area to buffer these storm surges that come in. So of course, if you have a waiver coming in, these storm actors and agilities can help to lessen the impact of those storms on our coastline. Those salt marshes also do something else that's really cool. Um, they store carbon, and all wetlands do. Um, they, they create, um, they act as a carbon sink. So basically that means that they store more carbon than they're actually putting out. And obviously the best case scenario is that uh, we keep wetlands on the landscape um, because if we're going to be draining wetlands or just carbon in any way, that um, can actually do the opposite of our activities. So our first thing that we want to do is always protect the wetlands. continue to be at risk is, of course, development. So in the top picture, you'll see this linear road here um, that would be cutting through some, some wetlands. You see agricultural fields. Um, you see ATV damage. You see pollution down in the corner there. Uh, certainly urbanization as well, um, urban sprawl. All of these reasons can really um, impact wetlands. And unfortunately, they continue to be at risk, especially in, in certain areas that are prone to urbanization or uh, agriculture. So that's why we want to do our part to try to protect them. And there's a number of ways that we can do that. So um, Dex Limited has conservation easements with the private landowners. So this, would, this uh, would be like an agreement, typically a 30-year agreement, to uh, protect a wetland on site. Uh, we have agreements with municipalities. We also um, acquire lands to protect them. Uh, of course, provincial and national parks are another way, and certainly by policy. And lastly, by learning more about them. So just attending this presentation this morning, you're already helping to conserve them. Because of course, the more we know about wetlands, um, the more we can do to try to protect them. So I think that's it for me. No, we were a little bit late getting started, but uh, I will hand it over to Sarah now to do the Kahoot. So I'll just switch my screen. So just take a minute. Something good. All right. So for anyone who's ever played Kahoot before. Um, it is uh, something that you're going to need a mobile device for. Uh, if you have one, that's great. If not, no big deal. You can always use a uh, pen and paper instead. So to get started, you're going to want to um, go to kahoot.it. So that's Kahoot, K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T. And then you're going to want to type, it's going to prompt you for a game pin. So this is the game.
being with him at the very top. So Alex, um, I'll just ask if you want to monitor the YouTube chat, if there's any like comments or questions about getting that set up. And otherwise, Sarah, I'll hand it over to you to actually do the questions. For sure. Um, I will just drop the pin into the chat as well. So it might be easier for copying and pasting and stuff like that. That sounds good. And Bria, if you want to join, you can go for it as well. There is a little bit of a delay between our side and the YouTube live side, so there might be a little bit of a, a wait, but that's all good. Is there anyone else who would like to join who has not um, been able to access Kahoot? Um, you can always just type in the chat if uh, you're having trouble accessing. We might go ahead then, if you're ready. Oh, Wetlands Rock is back. Okay, cool. All right, let's get started then. Okay, so the first question is, why are wetlands then we have, they support the food web, they improve water quality, they promote diversity of species, so biodiversity, or all of the above. And if you don't know the answer, you can just make your best guess. Okay, so if you clicked on any of those, you would be technically correct. Um, if you hit all of the above, you definitely would get more points if all of those answers were correct. Okay, this next question, is it true or false? So, fresh water can be found in lakes, rivers, streams, wetlands, and glaciers. Is this a true statement or is this false?
So everyone must practice saying if they're true at home on a piece of paper. That still counts, too. Yeah, so our fresh water, as we know, is found in lakes, rivers, streams, and wetlands, and glaciers. Um, although some wetlands can have also salt water. Um, but yeah, whereas oceans have seawater in it. So remember that for the next question. Okay, so true or false, there's more fresh water than seawater on Earth. And think about what Katie was saying when she was showing the picture of the globe and how most of it is blue. Okay, so um, when we think about what Katie was talking about, and she was mentioning how there is so much water on our Earth, but actually most of it is in the ocean, which we know is seawater or salty water, which is not actually fresh water. So what kinds of animals would you find in a wetland? We have ducks, fish. Wow, that's great. Yeah, so as Katie was saying, there is a huge abundance of species found in wetlands. Um, majority of them, though, are actually aquatic, which would be in that insect category there. Okay, so what animal is this? We have a beaver, a muskrat, a squirrel, or a capybara. Um, and pay attention to the tail. in Canada here. Okay, so we have another true or false. So, true or false, wetlands provide habitat for migrating birds. If you notice the picture here, that's actually an arctic tern, which has the largest migratory route of any bird. Everyone's right. Um, as Katie mentioned, wetlands do provide habitat for our migrating bird species. Okay, so we have another name this animal. So we have, is it an osprey? Is it a great blue heron? Is it a mallard duck? Is it a piping plover? And have you ever seen one of these before? Nice. Yeah, that is a great blue heron.
Okay, so uh, true or false, do wetlands support biodiversity? And biodiversity is just the abundance of species or the species richness in a specific habitat. Yep, everyone's right. That is definitely very true. Okay, so how much of Earth's water is fresh water? So this is the water that we talked about that we would find in the lakes and the rivers. We can remember back to what Katie was saying, how there's so much water on Earth. However, the percentage that is fresh water is much smaller. Wow. That's a good memory. All right, so another name is animal. So is this animal a mouse? Is it a muskrat? Is it a beaver? Is it an antelope? Yep, that is correct. That is a muskrat. Which we, if you got out and explored um, any local wetlands, you might come across, or maybe just their footprint. So, this is just a simple question. Are insects animals? What do you think? Yes, of course, or no, they're not. They're part of the animal family. They actually make up a very, very large percentage of our species here on Earth are insects, which are a huge family of, of animals here. All right, so we're going to name this animal again. So we have dragonfly, wasp, mosquito, or mayfly. Um, and for a hint, Katie did talk about this animal in her presentation. Nice. Yeah, so it is a German fly. Now for this question, you can actually click on more than one answer before you click submit. Um, so the question is, what are the types of wetlands? So we have a swamp, a fen, a marsh, and a bog. So for this question, there could be more than one answer. Um, and you can click which ones you think are right. They could all be right. Um, one second before you continue, Sarah, somebody's having trouble um, hearing you, so I'm going to try and turn up the volume settings on my end. I think it might be my, <laughs> my system that's making this quiet. It could be um, also just because we're uh, sharing music um, from the computing too. Maybe oh. That might be true. Yeah, my output volume's all the way up. Um, which, that was the last question anyway. So oh, okay. Should okay, so awesome. Click next and see what happens. 
So Freya took it, Landing Turtle in second, and Wetlands Rock in third. So, thank you guys for playing with our Kahoot game. Um, I know it's a bit tricky over YouTube and everything, but I think that uh, everyone set up the questions okay and could play at home. So, thank you everyone. All right. All right, Katie. Um, is that uh, the end of your segment there? Sure is, Alex. Do you have time for any questions briefly? Sure. Awesome. Um, if anybody has any questions for Katie and Sarah, if you could drop them in the chat um, and they will be able to answer them. One thing I'll also do, Alex, um, is put in the, I like, have the link to the Treasury Wellness Program in my presentation, but uh, maybe I'll also put the uh, link directly to that in the YouTube chat. Too. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, I have a question for you. Oh, Becky has the same question for you that I was going to ask. Um, what is your favorite Nova Scotia wetland? Oh, man. So many. How do I choose? Um, I'm going to be biased, I think, and um, say there's some amazing salt marsh complexes uh, down on the south shore of Nova Scotia. Um, which may or may not be where I'm from, so that's why I say I might be a bit biased. Um, but uh, particularly on uh, Cape Sable Island, uh, behind plenty of the beaches are some amazing salt marsh systems. So I would say that really is my favorite. That sounds lovely. Um, doesn't look like we have any other questions right now, but uh, if you have any more that you'd like to ask, you can always throw them in the chat and perhaps somebody will be able to answer them. Um, yeah, also email me as well. Um, I'll put that on the chat too. Okay, awesome. Thanks Alex for hosting. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for presenting. Next we have Bria who is going to be uh, giving us another presentation. So go ahead whenever you're ready, Bria. intro about me. My name is Bria. I'm a nature interpreter at the Shubenaki Provincial Wildlife Park. Um, so we do a lot of education programming, of course, more pre-COVID. Um, talk about conservation, wetlands, species at risk, of course, all the things in the park. Um, and today I'll be talking a little bit about urban wildlife. Um, so that's pretty cool. So first, what is urban wildlife? So pretty simple, I guess. Um, animals that have dominated by humans, um, so they encounter humans regularly. So, of course, animals that are living in big cities or towns, even suburbs, 
um, including those transition spaces between forests to cities. Um, all of those places, animals are going to be more likely to run into humans. Sorry to interrupt, Bria. Um, we're also having people who are having trouble. Um, okay. Is there any way to turn the your microphone up on your end? You know? uh, I can check. <laughs> Letting me exit out of my PowerPoint either. No. One second here, folks. We're just doing some a little bit of troubleshooting. I think it might be quieter. Do I just need to speak louder? I can find a yell on my laptop if that helps. If that sounds slightly better on my end, um, how about for everybody listening at home? I was just testing out the YouTube link, Alex, and it sounds like you just kind of static. It just, that's what it sounded like to me. Like there's a, almost like two sound sources. Oh. Interesting. Yeah, it also sounds, Alex, like they're like the pickup is um, is maybe coming through your computer instead of directly through the desktop. If that makes sense, but anyway, I guess we can all we all just talk louder. <laughs> Do our best. Um. Hmm. Yeah. I I have it on. I don't have it coming from my desktop, but it, I'm not sure. <laughs> um. I'll just try and stay silent. Um. If that works.
places that might have a lot of garbage, um, dumps, um, parks, garbage cans, things like that that are in the public and are easily accessible with a food source. They're also typically generalists, so they'll eat lots of different things. There are some animals that are specialists and they prefer to eat maybe like one or two specific food types. Um, and those animals tend to not be as suited for urban areas because they can't easily find those um, as easily as generalists can just find whatever food source that they're looking for and they're not picky. They're also usually very high in competition and adaptability. So animals that are successful in urban areas are really, really fast at adapting to these areas um, and quick to be able to kind of change their behaviors as well as they can outcompete. So there are some um, invasive or non-native species that are really good at urban areas and they will outcompete some of our native species. So like we have the Norway rat um, that is very common in urban areas. They're really good at outcompeting some other animals. Um, starlings are a non-native species. Also super common in urban areas. Easily outcompete some other bird species. And most um, species as well have a high tolerance for human disturbances. So living in urban areas, they're going to come across a lot of human disturbances. And the more um, tolerable that they are to those, the more likely they are to successfully live in these urban areas because they're not um, kind of bothered by human activity. Insects in urban areas, a lot of people them pests, um, but they are also wildlife that are very adapted to urban areas. Um, insects are small, so it allows for them to be able to have a smaller area in which they need to live, and they're also able to get inside homes and buildings. Of course, a lot of people complain they see um, Asian lady beetles coming into their house, um, wasps and ants especially, so most of these are seen as um, pest animals, but they're really, really good at living in these urban areas because of their size and just their quick adaptability. They don't need as much space as large mammals, and they're not as um, bothered by the human interactions, and they simply just kind of move around us, and they're so small. Um, it doesn't displace them. We also create some ideal habitats for some insects with our man-made structures. So specifically, um, there are mosquitoes that actually have been found to prefer um, man-made structures that hold stagnant water for them to lay their eggs. Um, so there's one type of mosquitoes called Aedes aegypti, um, which carries yellow fever. Um, we don't have them here in Canada. We're a little too far up north for them, but they're found um, in many places all over the world, and they've been found to prefer man-made structures like tires and containers that are left outside that hold stagnant water to lay their eggs and that's where mosquitoes lay their eggs so those are ones that not only um, can adapt to urban areas but prefer urban areas over um, some natural rural areas so there's um, different types of animals there are ones that simply adapt and they don't necessarily get a benefit from urban areas and there's also animals that exploit um, urban areas and they actually get a benefit from it. So things like mosquitoes and raccoons as well, they benefit, they can benefit from urban areas because of um, all these resources that are so available to them. Here's another, can you guess this animal? So I'll go through the questions. You can think to yourself about what this one may be. This one's a little tricky and the last one might give it away. So it is an animal in the rodent family. So think of all the animals that could be in the rodent family. It can be found in and around trees collecting seeds and nuts. So they love to eat seeds and nuts. And the last one. So they have light and dark stripes on the back of their head and running down their back. So if you said chipmunk, you'd be right. However, one of these is not a chipmunk. So the picture down on the bottom is a chipmunk but the one on the right is actually a squirrel. So here in Nova Scotia, we have chipmunks and we have red squirrels. Um, and the good way to tell them apart is the stripes. So chipmunks are also a little bit smaller. Um, 
and both of them are obviously very commonly seen in urban areas, um, living in trees or on the ground near trees. They're very territorial, so oftentimes you can hear them making their little chirping um, and little chattering sounds in the trees when other um, squirrels or chipmunks might get too close to them or humans. Um, but they're very adapted to living in kind of these small clusters of trees and areas within urban areas. So how do wildlife behaviors change? So in animals that live in urban areas, their behaviors um, can change due to human interaction. So animals may become crepuscular, which means they come out at dawn and dusk or nocturnal. So they come out at night to avoid human interactions. So um, most animals um, anyway that you think of that are common in urban areas are already nocturnal and then things like white-tailed deer, they're crepuscular and they may become a little bit more nocturnal. So they'll come out a little bit earlier in the day or a little bit later than they normally would if they want to avoid those humans. Um, of course, we're most active during the day. So the animals kind of come out at night to avoid us and have the least amount of interaction with us that they can. They also, um, communal feeding sites create densely populated areas. So even within these urban spaces, there's gonna be these clusters of populations that are larger because they might be in places like dumps or in places like parks where there's more abundant food sources out for them to get. So they will cluster around those areas where they know that they have food sources, as well as areas that they may have found that are more beneficial for them to um, live and kind of find a nice shelter in that habitat. They'll find that there's more clusters of them, as well as a higher population density overall in urban areas creates a greater risk of disease spread. So in urban areas, especially um, raccoons, they found that their range of habitat is so much smaller because everything is um, there for them to have in such a smaller, denser area. So that can create a greater risk of spread of various diseases um, like ringworm and distemper and things between the animals because they're all coming together in these spaces. Um, they also, as I said, smaller home ranges. So in an area in some rural place where there might not be a lot of resources for an animal, they might need a larger area, so maybe 50 kilometer area range. However, in a city or a town, they might need one kilometer or even 0.1 of a kilometer if they find a really, really rich habitat that has everything they need in this urban area. They also have dietary shifts. So of course, in urban areas, if they're largely going to be finding opportunities of food sources like compost bins and garbage cans, they're going to be eating a lot more of human food, which can change their diet. Um, of course, uh, animals, especially like raccoons and um, other small mammals that are eating our garbage and things like that can show signs of obesity. You know, they get quite large because they don't have to go scavengering for that food, as well as they're eating a lot of food that we've made that isn't necessarily good for them to eat. Um, and they might become more bold and curious, losing their fear of humans. So of course, um, naturally humans are going, or animals are going to be scared of humans. Um, so, living in an urban area, they might lose that. They see us so often and they become so used to it that they lose that fear and they won't stay away from us as much as they would in a rural area, which can be a little bit concerning. And increased in reproductive success. So if they have a higher food source and they're doing better, this will allow them to have a greater reproductive success because that's less stress on them um, to find food sources. So their populations in urban areas can actually go up quicker than in rural areas. Um, but with that, of course, mortality and survival both might be increased or decreased. So in urban areas, of course, there's more roadways and um, accidents where animals might be hit on roads and killed or they might also have more predators. So in more urban areas, um, predators might be following them in and realize that there's also more prey in those areas. 
So things like mortality and survival rate can both go up and down. Okay, and here's the can you tell the difference? So here's two pictures and they are different species and they are very hard to tell apart. So one is a crow and one is a raven. So I'll give you a second. You can just try and think about it, figure out which one might be which. And then I'll give you kind of some hints to try and tell the difference, although it is difficult. So the one on the left is a crow and the one on the right is a raven. So crows are smaller. Ravens are actually quite a bit bigger. They're about just about the size of a red tailed hawk, a little bit smaller. Um, while crows, obviously you see those more often, they're just a little bit smaller than that. They're not quite the size of a raptor. Um, crows are often in groups. They're very family oriented um, and they'll kind of all help each other raise their young and things together. While ravens are often seen in pairs and of course you can see both on their own. Um, a good way to tell is their tail shape. So crows have what's called a fan shaped tail, um, which as you can imagine is just sort of a rounded tail. All of the feathers are about the same length. A raven has what it's called as a wedge shaped tail, essentially if you can imagine a diamond. So the tail feathers in the middle, in the center, are longer than the tail feathers on the end, creating a kind of diamond shape. So when they're flying overhead, that's a really good way to tell, especially when it's hard to tell size when they're flying. And crows, of course, have that higher pitched caw sound that you often hear, where ravens have a deeper pitched, almost croak-like sound. Um, and in urban areas, of course, crows are much more likely to be seen than ravens. Um, so if you see one in an urban area, it's most likely a crow. However, if you wanted to tell the difference and you're not sure, those are some tips of how you may be able to tell. So human wildlife conflict. So of course, higher population density means there's a higher risk of human wildlife conflict. These animals have a much higher chance than animals in rural areas. Um, to run into human and then, of course, cause some conflict. So feeding animals like birds or stray cats and dogs can lead to an increase of conflict due to food availability. So the animals will quickly figure out that this is a, a place where they can find a food source and they will come back over and over again, um, especially if you're leaving food out. Um, you know, you're not purposely doing this, obviously, and trying to invite these wildlife in, but they they will find these food sources. And there's also that means there's higher populations of prey species coming in to get this food, which then leads to predators possibly following them in. So we have a cute picture here on the right of a bobcat. So a lot of times people will leave things like bird feeders out. Um, and then, you know, small animals might come along. Um, we have a picture of a bird feeder and a cute chipmunk eating out of one of our food dishes. Um, so those being left out, the animals will come and bobcats might follow those prey species in to hunt those. So you might be trying to do something really good and leaving these out and accidentally inviting these larger species in. So what can you do to help urban wildlife? So the first one, put away bird feeders at night and clean up fallen seeds from underneath. So that's a great way if you're worried about potentially having these predators come in, um, taking them in at night and making sure that the sp spilled food is cleaned up is a great way, as well as leaving cat or dog food outside overnight. Um, you know, maybe leave it out during the day and then take it in at night so you at least can kind of monitor throughout the day what's happening. Also, keeping your compost stored inside until collection day is a great way to keep things like raccoons, bears, um, small rodents, things like that away um, if you can. Um, also, reporting wildlife sightings on apps like iNaturalist. So various apps, if you think you see a species at risk as well, there are um, ways to report those to the government so they're aware of where these species are being seen. But reporting wildlife sightings is really great. So iNaturalist is an awesome app um, for citizen science that you can download, take a picture and upload it. It says where you saw it um, and you can fill out all that information, which is really a great resource for people to see where these animals are being seen. You can also plant native species to help insects like butterflies and bees. So, of course, um, as Katie mentioned, the monarch butterfly 
Um, they like a very specific plant called milkweed. Um, and other butterflies and bees, of course, need pollinators like um, different plants and flowers. So planting native species that we have here, things like milkweed and stuff, they are a great way to use those, maybe a small backyard that you have with a garden um, and plant those. So it doesn't take up too much space, but it really helps um, those animals. Um, don't litter, of course. Um, Littering is bad everywhere, but especially in urban areas, it's so easy because it's so densely populated. Don't litter. And also garbage cleanup is a really great thing to do. Um, I know I used to do highway cleanups um, for garbage on the sides of busy streets and roadways, um, and that was a really great way to kind of help their habitat stay clean and observe wildlife from a safe distance. So of course, even in urban areas, it's kind of hard to keep your distance sometimes, but the best way is to observe them from afar and not get too close, um, again, for human wildlife conflict. So um, I guess if people have questions, they can put them in the chat and I'll do my best to answer. I've also linked my email. Um, if you ever have any other questions as well, feel free to email me. Um, I can always point you in the right direction of who to get in contact with or answer the question myself. Um, so yeah, I hope you learned a little bit anyway about urban wildlife. Yeah, so um, of course of age is a big thing, but in urban areas, um, some raccoons have actually been shown to um, shown signs of pre-diabetes. So they really just will eat whatever they can find and they don't necessarily stop when they're full. So they keep getting bigger and bigger. So um, if you live in an area where maybe people are feeding their raccoons or they have access to um, garbage cans and things like that. That's probably why they're a lot bigger. Um, raccoons that live in very rural areas and have to hunt for their food and um, expel a lot more energy to look for it, um, they're gonna be a little smaller. So that's why um, when you get into more urban areas, they tend to look a little bigger and chunkier. Yeah, I feel like people in the city are used to very large raccoons. Um, they're not all that big, but yes, it's becoming a lot more common um, for them to find um, open food sources and just eat all the food they can get their hands on. <laughs> no problem. Thank you for having me. Yeah, hey, can you see me, hear me okay? Uh, okay, we had the problem before. Oh, good. I think it's the first time I've actually gotten my Teams camera to work on time. It always like delayed by a few minutes. Uh, well, hi, thanks for having me. Um, this is really exciting. I just came out of the Nation Nova Scotia AGM, which is also exciting, but quite a bit more dry than this. So I'm really excited to talk about feathers. Um, oh, and hello to our other presenters. I can't see you guys, but I, I know you're there. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen here and I'll load up my, uh, my presentation. All right, can you guys see feathers? Okay. I should say if I get interrupted with barking that's my puppy in the backyard yelling at the uh, pheasant that torments him so I apologize in advance <laughs> I 
<laughs> okay, great. Yeah, I know we're a little bit over time, so I won't keep you guys super long, but I did want to give you just a quick overview around feather science, what it is that makes feathers feathers and why they're so cool, um, and maybe give you some experiments that you can do at home with feathers that are probably pretty easy to find around your neighborhood right now, even if you do live in, in an urban environment, because um, there's a lot of birds that are out there fighting right now for mates and space um, and potentially losing feathers. And there might be some young birds that are losing some downy feathers. So yeah, so hopefully it's something that you guys can, can do at home. So what are feathers? We should start there. And I like to tell people that feathers are like really weird fingernails. So imagine flying with your fingernails. And I say that because feathers are made of keratin. They're also made of some other things, but keratin is a pretty major component in them. And it's not quite the same kind of keratin as the one that your fingernails uh, are made of or that you might find in other structures on your own body like hair. Um, it's a kind of tougher keratin with a slightly different chemical makeup, but it is in the same group of chemicals, which is pretty cool. Uh, feathers are also hollow, which I know probably a lot of our young naturalists already know because you guys are super keen, um, but that being hollow makes them really light. So at the same time, they're nice and stiff because they're made of this hard structure of keratin. They're also really light and that makes them perfect for flight. So let's take a closer look at feathers because they're really cool to look at up close. So this is the feather structure all together. So you've got your shaft at the bottom. That's definitely hollow. If you've ever made a feather pen or if you've ever just broken a feather in half, you might have noticed that there is that hole right, right down the, the shaft. And in some feathers, it's hollow pretty well all the way to the end. Um, kind of depends on the species or the type of feather you're looking at. Um, but most get um, most aren't hollow by about mid midway. Um, and the really cool part of feathers, when you look closer at these barbs, so feathers look all nice and soft, but they're actually full of these really, really tight hooks that are all meshed together, and that's what holds the feather together. And I'm sure if you've picked up a feather, you've probably kind of pried the pieces apart and seen how they, they kind of unzipper themselves. Maybe you've tried to put them back together. That's that barb action there. So the first level in that barb structure is the barb itself. And that's these long, long filaments here. And if you zoom in even closer, you can see another set of barbs called barbules. So there's kind of a level of layers and layers here. So this is really close in a feather and you can see the barb running all the way along the feather. And then if you look super close, you can kind of see those little barbules sticking out and locking together. And that's what zippers the feather together. So these are super cool structures. And like I said, great for flight, but feathers didn't start off as flight structures. So why do birds have feathers? Well, we think that they inherited them from their dinosaur ancestors. So a lot of dinosaurs, if you look at old movies, like, what have we got out there? Fantasia, Land Before Time, pretty well all dinosaur movies that I grew up on. The dinosaurs are always illustrated as these big scaly beasts that don't really have any other features. They might be weird colors, but they're, they're very reptilian looking. But we now know that there were a group of dinosaurs, particularly the, uh, the ones that birds are related to, that did have feathers. We're not entirely sure why they had them, but probably there were a couple purposes for them. It might not have been the same purpose for all those dinosaurs. It's probably a couple different things. So evolution is a little bit weird that way. Something could start off as being an accident. Maybe it was a weird mutation. Some dinosaurs just had these weird little frilly downy feathers at some point in their life. Um, and maybe that ended up having some useful purpose later on. Maybe they started off with a particular purpose. It could have been to attract mates. It could have been to keep them warm if they were living somewhere chilly. Not totally sure. We have a few ideas there, but whatever it was, birds inherited those feathers. And that's how we went from T-Rex to the Canada goose. And that relationship might seem surprising if you're just learning about it, but if you've ever met a Canada goose, it's not surprising at all, right? Because they are the T-Rexes of today. <laughs> this is my uh, relationship with geese. I don't like them very much. I've been chased a couple times. But this is where we ended up. 
So this is a ground bird and you can say, see he's very prettily displaying here. Now feathers have a whole lot of uses in birds today and you can see quite a couple different kinds of feathers in this bird. So I won't go into too much detail about them because I'm actually going to ask you guys some questions about them in a little bit. But you can definitely see right off there's a feather on the top of this bird's head. There's a big frilly collar that this bird has puffed up around its neck. Um, it has some kind of flat interlocking feathers around its breast and onto its belly. And then can't really see them super well in this photo, but behind him, it looks like there are some big tail feathers. So all of those have a different purpose. And we'll go over some of those purposes. Here's one of everybody's favorite birds. So here's an owl, a barred owl, I believe. Uh, owls have really cool feathers that are adapted um, for silence. So unlike this bird, which is super pretty, but also very loud, if you've ever heard a uh, distinctive drumming in the woods, you know what this bird is. Um, this bird flaps really, really hard to make a drumming sound, uh, to attract mates, to tell other birds that it's around. But our owls, they're being predators, of course, they've got to be very quiet. So their feathers look like this. So this is a flight feather on an owl. And you can see there's this almost comb-like structure on, on one side towards the edge of the feather. And what that structure does is it cuts down on wind resistance for the owl. So while they're flying, especially while they're, well, very quickly landing and, and snatching something off the ground, um, they're not making any sound and you can kind of experiment with that at home so if you take a feather it could be a real one or a fake one if you move it around really fast if it's a hard kind of light looking feather you're probably going to make a bit of noise with that that wind resistance these feathers are super quiet so if you do have a feather at home that you don't mind uh, ruining for an experiment if you just take a look at these combs and cut a couple cuts into the side of your feather and then try waving it around. I bet you'll hear a difference. Some birds also have feathers for a social purpose. So this is a black-throated blue warbler and it's probably one of our prettiest, most colorful local birds. Um, blue feathers are really weird though. So this bird is showing off to its mates. This is a male warbler. Um, but its feathers aren't actually blue. So here's another cool experiment you can try at home. I want to talk a bit about pigments versus light scattering. So pigments are the things that uh, they absorb light, they reflect some kinds of light. Um, so in our bodies, we have things like melanin. They give color to our skin, our hair, our eyes. And there's different kinds of melanin and some people have more or less of various kinds of melanin. And generally the colors, the pigments that those kinds of compounds create in our bodies and, and other animals are tones like yellow, brown, um, kind of, you know, nature-y colors. Um, colors like blue uh, don't really exist in pigments. It's really hard to find a true pigment blue color. So blue pigment is super rare which you might not know if you live in North America because there are quite a few bluebirds like blue jays and our, our black-throated blue warbler. So here's an experiment you can do. So if you have a blue feather, now it needs to be a real one because fake feathers do have a pigment. They've been purposely dyed. Um, but a real blue feather, if you find a blue jay feather or maybe you're really lucky and you found a, a, a tiny warbler feather, when you look at it under normal light, it looks blue, right? Just like this photo of the, the blue jay. But try backlighting it. So take a light source. It could be a flashlight. It could be the light on your ceiling. Turn all the other lights off and look at that feather from behind. So you'll need a light source, your feather. This is a blue jay feather that I actually found at Shuby Park one day. And here's front lighting. So this feather is a little bit drab. I think this one was discarded maybe during a molt, um, but it's definitely blue, right? You can see that distinctive blue and black banding of our, uh, our blue jay friends. And when the light is on in the front, we're viewing this from front lighting, it's definitely a blue color. But if we look at it from behind, if we put our light source behind, it's brown. 
And so this is something that's really fun to do if you have a feather, just kind of move it in between, move it in and out of that light. You can even hold it over the flashlight, turn it one way and then turn it the other to have a look. So the brown in this feather is actually the true pigment. That's the true color of blue jay, well, in all blue, blue birds feathers. Um, the true pigment is brown, but what's happening in the blue jay is the feathers themselves and some of the molecules that make up the feather, they are shaped in a way that make these little pockets. And when light hits those pockets, it gets scattered all around. And the light that ends up back in your eyes is blue light. You might have learned about that in school when you talk about the rainbow and prisms and how white light can get broken up into a whole bunch of different colors. One of them is, of course, blue, and that just happens to be the one that makes it back. So that's a really cool thing that birds can do. So they look blue, but they're actually brown. Uh, it's actually not just blue feathers, though. Also green feathers. So green, like blue, is not super common as a pigment. Pigment usually comes in browns, reds, yellows. But when you put that blue scattering, if you have those pockets on top of a pigment like yellow, then you're going to get green. So this is a black-throated green warbler, unlike our, our, like our black-throated blue warbler. And it has those greenish feathers on its back because it's yellow, but it also has those pockets. So if you find a green or blue feather, definitely try that out at home. It's one of my favorite experiments. Let's talk about feather types. So there are lots of types of feathers, even on the same bird. Um, some are for flight, some are for beauty, um, some are keeping birds warm, um, and some seem to have very strange purposes that we would never think of. So these are flight feathers. They're long, sturdy. These are the first feathers that I showed you. So the ones that zipper together really nicely. Uh, and these are the feathers that allow for, for flight, for lift, right? They're super strong, but they're also light. These are contour feathers. So they're very similar to our flight feathers, but they are smaller and they're usually laid on top of each other in a way that gives the bird a nice sleek form. So this is what makes birds really aerodynamic uh, or in the case of a water bird can make them really hydrodynamic. They just give a nice shape to the bird. And also good for insulation. They're kind of like the top, top layer. But the best feathers for keeping a bird warm are these downy feathers. So these are also some feathers uh, in most birds. These are the feathers that most birds develop first. So this is why when you see a baby bird, if they have any feathers on them yet, they're going to be kind of scraggly looking because they are these uh, less, less structured, very, very wispy feathers. And then we have statement feathers. So any kind of feather could become a feather that has a social purpose, and these can be super weird. Evolution is funny this way, and that just about anything can become something that is just a feature you want to show off. So you could think about a, a peacock, if you've been out to the, the wildlife park, it's called peacocks that roam the grounds there, and they have those huge tail feathers, right? Um, there's also a bird native to North America. This is a turkey that also has really huge tail feathers. But these are big birds in general, so it wouldn't be crazy if they had big tail feathers, but this is getting to be a bit excessive, right? You might notice in a lot of bird species that it's typically the males that have these really showy statement feathers or groups of statement feathers. Um, and that's because in a lot of birds, it is the males who are doing that, that showing off. Look how pretty I am. I would make a great mate kind of thing. If you're into turkeys, I guess. I don't find them really pretty. So here's another experiment you can do. Find a couple different types of feathers. So maybe a flight feather, you could find a downy feather, and then something somewhere in between. And we're going to experiment with drag and wind resistance. So you could take all three feathers, maybe get your siblings, your cousins, or your friends out. Everybody gets one feather, pick one spot. Maybe it's on top of a chair. Make sure your parents are supervising you. Maybe it's off a deck, or if you live in the city and you have a balcony and you don't mind losing your feather, drop them all at the same time and see where the feathers go. Some are gonna drop pretty quick. Some are going to kind of float. Um, and some might do something really weird. They might just blow away altogether. I'm not going to tell you what happens to them. You'll have to do this on your own. 
Um, but keep this question in mind, you know, which feather is creating the most drag or resistance when, when you're running around with it or when you're dropping it off? Um, I did put running around with them here. So that's something you can do if you don't want to lose your feather, if you don't want to drop them from a, a height, you can just run around with them really fast and feel that drag in your hand. All right, here's a little quiz for you guys. So if you know the identity of any of these birds, you can type them into the chat. So we've got three different birds here or at least three different feathers here. We'll see if we can guess what they are. So number one is a light colored feather. There's a group of feathers here. Uh, one in the foreground is kind of wispy looking, but the majority of them are kind of firm and there's some pretty obvious striping to them. So kind of white and black or white and very dark brown. And then number two here, we have those pretty classic flight feathers. So that long, stiff form there's some downiness at the beginning of that first one um, and that's not uncommon in in flight or, or tail feathers but most of that structure is that long sleek form right and they're kind of a mottled black brown color mostly black somewhere kind of in between and then number three is a very stripy group of feathers so these feathers are all lined up together i think there's one two three four five maybe six of them there um, striped, but definitely that, that sleek kind of uh, flight feather form. What do you guys think? Oh, sorry, I could have gone slower. I have more. So number one there is our snowy owl. So that's where you're seeing that, that striping. So those were the contour feathers that we were looking at there, probably right on the chest. Number two was an eagle. So eagle feathers, I mean, depending on which ones you're finding, these ones are probably, well, they're probably wing feathers, um, but they, they could be, depending on where in the wing they are, I mean, they're probably somewhere in the middle of the wing. Sometimes when you find eagle feathers, they're super long and super black. Um, but you have to remember when you find a feather that birds come in lots of different colors, even within one species, right? So these eagle feathers could have come from a juvenile that isn't entirely black yet, or they could be from, uh, from the middle of the wing, which maybe aren't as long and black as the rest. And then number three is that ruffed grouse, so the same bird that we saw earlier, and those are tail feathers. So those are the ones on the very end there that you can just see behind him. Let's try these ones. So number one, definitely some sort of flight feather, whether it's from a wing or a tail. I'm gonna guess a wing just because it has that kind of off-centered symmetry. Um, and it's kind of a reddish orange color. And then number two is a super long feather. It looks like it's at the beach. Um, also has that off-centered symmetry where one, one side is much bigger than the other. So I'm gonna guess that's a wing feather. And it's kind of white with black, maybe a touch of gray. Yeah, and then number three is a downy feather. Looks like it's also on the beach and it is entirely white. What do you guys think? I'll give you a little more time for that one. I see a lot of people did guess the uh, that owl in the chat. Nice work, guys. Some feathers are a lot easier than others to ID. What do you think? So number one is a cardinal. And I have never been lucky enough to find a cardinal feather. I had to take that photo from the internet. But cardinal feather is maybe a little easier than some others to ID just because there aren't a whole lot of solid red birds out there, right? But number two and number three, little trickier they're actually the same bird so these are herring gulls and they're at the beach so in this case IDing a bird might come down more to the setting that you found your feather in um, that first feather is a downy feather or that third feather I should say the downy feather uh, and those are going to be especially hard to ID if you find a single downy feather you know and you're not really sure what bird it was 
it's hard to guess where a downy feather might have come from on a bird. It could have been that under feathering, that that stuff that's keeping them warm. It could have been from a young bird that was preening, or maybe it's from a bird fight. Um, number two is a little bit easier. I mean, that's definitely a, a wing feather and definitely looks like a like a seagull. That one could even be a great black back gull. Um, but I'm gonna guess herring gull just where they're they're so common. So there is a really great resource out there for you guys if you want some help IDing your feathers. This is what I use at home quite a bit if I find a feather I'm not sure of. This is the Feather Atlas, and it's a resource um, from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, and I put the uh, the website here, but I'll, I'll send it maybe in a follow-up email to folks who have registered for the celebration as well. Um, this is a really great resource. It has so many photos of feathers, but what I like about it is that you can actually search for feathers by their traits. So if you're not sure what kind of bird you have, you can at least go to white long wing feathers or downy blue feathers and look them up that way. That's a really great resource to be aware of. Feather care. So feathers take a lot of work to grow and take care of because they are such important structures and they cover the entire bodies of most birds. So birds are going to molt, most birds are going to molt uh, maybe a couple times in a year, at least once, and they're going to regrow a lot of their feathers, if not almost all of them. Um, you're also going to lose feathers, you know, if you're a bird that is, especially young, if you're a male right now, it's springtime, everybody's looking for a mate, there's probably going to be some scuffles, um, you're going to be flying around a lot, landing, maybe displaying to the females, um, so all that wear and tear can definitely, it can uh, rough up your feathers, it can cause you to lose some feathers. And then there's just weather, you know, especially if you're a bird that lives in a really harsh environment, like a coast or maybe out in the ocean. Um, feathers aren't good at keeping you warm or, or for doing their purpose if they're, uh, if they're falling off um, or not zippered. So birds have these little glands. They're usually close to their bums. And they use those to preen their feathers and coat them with an oil to protect them. And some birds, birds, typically birds that live out on the ocean, they are really oily. They're essentially waterproofing themselves. So we can see a kingfisher in this photo just preening his feathers. He might be oiling them up or he might just be kind of arranging them so that they're not so, maybe he got into a fight and he's putting them all back in place. Here's a bunch of birds that are also preening. So here's one of those aquatic birds. We've got a, a cormorant in the top right. Those are super oily birds. And you can tell just by looking at them because they've got that kind of sheen to them, right? Um, a duck down at the bottom that looks like maybe a black duck doing some preening too. And then our, our Canada geese, T-Rex birds in the left, they're also preening. Before I wrap up, here are some weird feather facts. Birds are strange animals. Some birds have more feathers than others. So obviously some birds are bigger than others, but there's also quite a bit of difference in how many feathers a single bird might have. So hummingbirds, which are physically very small birds, they also have the fewest number of feathers. Their feathers are a little bit more densely arranged than some other birds, but there are still very few of them. Whereas penguins, don't live in Nova Scotia, but significantly more to the south, um, they have the most feathers. Uh, and that's not really surprising when you think about where penguins live. Not only do they need those downy feathers close to their bodies, keeping them warm, but they also have to have a really dense interlocking coat on the outside to keep them dry on the inside, right? And penguins don't want ice water touching their, their skin. So they have that oily, thick, interlocking uh, coat of feathers on the outside, made up of a whole bunch of individual feathers. Downy feathers are really great insulation. They're so good that we actually use them in clothes. Uh, we use them in a lot of winter coats. Um, and that's because they're full of those air pockets. So a bunch of downy feathers piled together. I mean, there's definitely lots of nice air pockets in a pile of feathers. But the feathers themselves, too, because there are hollow structures within there and because there are little gaps between barbs, they make really good insulation. Big birds don't necessarily have big feathers. So eagles are super big. They also have big feathers, which you know if you've ever found one of those wing feathers. But peacocks have super long tail feathers. 
And the bird with the actual longest feather record belongs to a chicken. And I think these are a kind of, oh, I think they're a kind of Chinese chicken. I forget the name of them now. Um, but they're quite a bit smaller than both the peacock and the eagle. But they have insanely long tail feathers. So how long a feather is, how big a feather is, how thick a feather is, and what color a feather is all depends on its purpose, what bird it belongs to, why that bird is using the feather. So, a lot of feathers out there. Here's some cool things you can do with feathers. So I really love contour feathers. They make great earrings and I'm a big fan of feather earrings. So whenever I find a feather, especially if I have a matching set, I always think about turning them into jewelry for myself. But there's a lot of things you can do with feathers. Um, if you're going to be crafting with feathers that you're finding outside, uh, just a note of caution there. I mean, if a feather has been discarded, especially, it might have been discarded for a reason. You're going to want to check for things like parasites, ticks, mites, anything that a bird could have been carrying around. Um, and make sure you've cleaned that feather up before you're going to use it in your crafts. So some feathers can be washed with soap and water without damaging them too much. You might just want to be careful about that zippering if you want to keep your, your zippered feathers intact. Um, another thing you can do is put your feathers into a sealed bag for a little bit with something like mothballs, which can kill um, some less sturdy mites and, and other parasites. So you lock them up in there for a little bit, take them out. They should be more or less sterile. I usually like to give mine a nice bath in soapy water anyway. Yeah. And that's it for feathers today. I'm happy to answer any questions you have, or, or if not, we can, we can wrap it up. Feathers are always fun. Oh, feathers are always fun. They're always a good find. Oh, yes. I make a lot of jewelry out of feathers that I found. I don't have any on me right now, actually, although I did just pick up uh, a whole bird about a month ago from someone at the Bird Society who found a um, an unfortunate roughed grouse outside of their window I think he'd hit hit the window so I did manage to pick up some uh some tail feathers that I'm going to turn into maybe a hat accessory I'm not sure well I might just remind folks that the rest of the celebration is still going on so the uh, Nature Nova Scotia AGM is going to wrap up here in just a little bit and then we will be on a, an afternoon break to get outside and go explore together um, and then we're going to be back in presentations this evening so yeah if you're looking for resources to get outside today um, if you're going to go birding maybe look for some feathers uh, there are some things on the, both the Nature Nova Scotia and Young Naturalist Club's web page but uh, no, that's about it. I'm probably going to go check on my garden and my puppy. Yeah. Oh, that's a hard question. Hmm. Well, I do. I really like hummingbirds. Our, our local hummingbirds here are just so cute, especially males if they have that bright red red throat but I don't know if I would call them my favorite I have a lot of favorite ducks too I suppose because I make a lot of stuff out of feathers I would have to pick maybe a duck or a ground bird just because I like feathers so much so maybe I would pick hmm, maybe I would pick a green wing teal they have some of the best feathers and they're a super cute bird Great. 
Thanks so much for hosting, Alex.